It's depressingly common for otherwise great movies to fall flat at the last hurdle with a deeply terrible ending, in turn compromising the entire experience. But the other way around? Not so common. Now, a big prefix before we get into this, this is a mega subjective list and not every movie here you may think of as actually being terrible. And that's cool, it's all in good faith and we all have different takes, so I'm Ewan, this is What Culture, and here are eight terrible movies with awesome endings. Number eight, Meg 2, The Trench. The original Meg wasn't a great movie, but it knew precisely what it was and delivered the goods accordingly, albeit within the confines of a gore-free PG-13 rating. It performed really well at the box office, enough for Warner Brothers to greenlight a sequel, and when acclaimed horror filmmaker Ben Wheatley was announced to direct, Curiosity was stoked to see how his unique sensibilities would translate to a mega-budget blockbuster. The truth, sadly, is that the majority of Meg 2 The Trench is a strangely dull, low-energy follow-up in which Wheatley gets to flex barely an ounce of his fierce filmmaking muscle. Even with the eminent charms of lead Jason Statham, far too much time is spent on snoozy human dramas and not enough on, well, the Megs. That is, until the third act arrives and we get all the Megs we could hope for. And the action shifts from the muddy depths of the Mariana Trench to Fun Island, a resort that becomes overrun with Megs, quasi-dinosaur creatures called Snappers, and best of all, a giant freaking squid. Meg 2's third act is basically what the entire movie should have been. Once on Carnage without all the tiresome chit chat that bogged down the first hour plus. Number seven, Dark Phoenix. It wasn't exactly a surprise that Dark Phoenix was a huge bust, but it brought Fox's X-Men franchise sputtering to a disappointing halt all the same. From a writing and directing perspective, so much of this movie feels completely flat. It's just the fact we've seen most of it done better elsewhere, and between a lifeless performance from Sophie Turner as Jean Grey and Jennifer Lawrence not even pretending to be interested, it felt like an obligation for most of the cast involved. But the final scene at least delivers something approaching a genuinely affecting sign-off for the entire two-decade saga, as a retired Charles Xavier is greeted at a Parisian cafe by Magneto before the pair play a friendly game of chess. It's not a scene full of operatic, dramatic grandstanding, but circles back to Charles and Eric's chess games from the earlier films in a slightly affecting way. It's an ending that deserved a much better film leading up to it. Number six, Staying Alive. 1983's Saturday Night Fever sequel, Staying Alive, is a really bad movie, and by way of its hilariously awful dialogue and unrelenting, poorly staged dance sequences, it absolutely earned its critical drubbing. Yet, director Sylvester Stallone did nevertheless master up one of the most fist-pumping endings of all time, when protagonist Tony Monero's Broadway debut goes down a storm and he reconciles with his girlfriend Jackie. Travolta's Tony then professes to Jackie that he needs to do one more thing in order to celebrate correctly, strut. And so, the Bee Gees' iconic Staying Alive, which was written for Saturday Night Fever's opening sequence, plays as Tony confidently struts through Times Square. Capped off by a glorious closing freeze frame, it's a perfect combination of cheesy and triumphant. Number five, Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday. The ninth Friday the 13th movie gets a lot of justified vitriol, primarily because Jason Voorhees only appears in his physical form briefly, with his spirit instead possessing various characters for most of the movie. The setup just didn't really work, with only the film's final 60 seconds doing much to entice all the Jason Jason heads who'd stuck with the series through thick and thin, and because it's Friday the 13th, there is a lot of thin. In the laughable climax, a reborn Jason is dragged to hell as promised by the title, but the final scene shows Jason's mask being unearthed by a dog. Moments later, Freddy Krueger's gloved hand bursts out of the dirt and pulls the mask to hell, all while Freddy's signature demonic cackle can be heard. Coming at the end of a depressingly awful conclusion to the Friday the 13th franchise, this tease of a future Freddy vs. Jason movie felt like an oasis in the middle of a desert, a much needed solve that promised greater things to come, even if it took an additional decade to materialize. Number four, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2022. None of the 1974 Texas Chainsaw Massacre's follow-ups really approach the original in terms of depth, imagery, or raw adrenaline, with more than one sliding into the downright terrible category. David Blue Garcia's 2022 effort, which ignores all other sequels Halloween 2018 style, 
may not rest squarely at the bottom, but it is a garbled mess of a film that leans into slasher convention, undermining any salient commentary it may have to say on gun violence or political division in the process. However, the film does have a ripper of an ending, a real rug pull moment that, while in the vein of a Friday the 13th final jump scare, is brutally effective in how unrelentingly cruel it is. After dueling with and seemingly defeating Leatherface, protagonist Melody and Lila prepare to leave Harlow in a self-driving car, quite literally letting their guard down for an easy journey back home. And then Leatherface suddenly emerges, drags Melody out the window and decapitates her, all while Lila screams as the car drives away. Leatherface dances in the street with the head, getting the last laugh on those pesky gentrifiers and leaving the film on an appropriately gutting note. Number three, Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones. My relationship with Attack of the Clones has taken a curious evaluation in recent years. To be blunt, this was the first time I faced disappointment in a movie as a child. I loved and still love The Phantom Menace, but clones at the time felt like a turgid, awkwardly romantic follow-up filled with lots of iffy effects. As I've grown older, I still think that much of that remains the case, but I do at least see and appreciate what George Lucas was going for. Clones is meant to be Star Wars ran through the filter of a 70s political thriller. Like the parallax view, but instead of Warren Beatty unearthing a global cabal of assassins, you have Ewan McGregor going to Camino to look at sea otters. We're looking at sea otters. Six of them here. Oh, and a giant clone army. That's also important. The film is politically prescient, an indictment of the lure of conflict and the terrible freedoms it gobbles up. And yeah, despite some wooden dialogue, I think Hayden Christensen was dealt a harsh deck. Anakin is meant to be annoying in this story. The main issues here really are a mix of half-baked characters, thank God Dooku was saved by the expanded canon, and technical ugliness that sludgifies Lucas's once ornate cosmic tapestry. And despite all of this, the film still has a hauntingly beautiful ending. John Williams' Imperial March has never been more menacing, with the Republic having ushered in its own means of destruction through the creation of a standing army. A company that, with Yoda's begun the Clone War has, and you're left with one of the best mic drop moments in the entire franchise. Number two, Thor, The Dark World. There's plenty of fan debate about precisely how bad Thor, The Dark World is, but it's near universally accepted to be one of the weakest MCU movies. From its forgettable villain to its cringeworthy comic relief, flat visuals, and anonymous direction, it's an also-ran superhero movie sequel that's basically the summation of every complaint that's ever been leveled against the MCU. But that ending? Ooh, that's a good one. Given that Tom Hiddleston's Loki was the sure highlight of the original Thor and proved himself to be a terrifically entertaining villain in the first Avengers, seeing him die at the end of this movie's second act hit hard. But what a relief it was when the final scene saw Thor have a heartfelt reunion with his father Odin in Asgard. Or oh, so it seemed, until Thor leaves and it's revealed that Loki, ever the trickster, is still alive and was impersonating Odin all along. It's a scene that forced audiences to perk up at the end of an otherwise deeply forgettable film and relish the fact that the MCU didn't just jettison one of its best characters after a mere two movies. And number one, Dracula 2000. It's always a bad sign when a movie plasters the name of someone tangentially associated with it all over the marketing. And so when Dracula 2000 billed itself with executive producer Wes Craven's name as a prefix, it felt like a calculated admission that the film couldn't rest on its own merits. And yeah, Dracula 2000 sucks. It's an aggressively early 2000s riff on Dracula Dracula, which with its edgy new metal soundtrack and painfully dated wardrobe choices, is a comically stodgy product of its era. Like the horror movie Daredevil, I guess. For the record, I love that vibe, but yeah, it's not great. Dracula 2000 is, for 90% of its runtime, a thoroughly uninteresting reimagining of Dracula lore, until it finally trips and stumbles over its one truly great idea in a closing scene. Here, it's revealed that Gerard Butler's Dracula is actually Judas Iscariot who was cursed by God to live forever as a vampire due to his betrayal of Jesus Christ. It's one of those revelations that genuinely forces you to reconsider everything you've just seen, and though Dracula 2000 is still a fundamentally stinky bad movie, its final rug pull does provide some wildly unexpected food for thought. And there we have it, eight terrible movies with awesome endings. Apologies if a film you love came up here, but let us know if it did and why you think it isn't terrible. Maybe throw 
Jordan and alternative while you're down there too. Otherwise, thank you all so much for watching. Drop the video a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe if you want to see more. Either way, I've been Ewan, you've been watching What Culture, and I'll hopefully catch you next time. Bye!